Without Shamsundar Prabhu, without his endeavor, without his determination to serve Srila Prabhupada, we wouldn't be here all today congregated. Um, we wouldn't have Bhaktivedanta Manor. We wouldn't have the opportunity to actually serve Krishna. So um, that's why Pandava Sena and all the youth and all the uh, UK Yatra were so grateful to you. Uh, because without you, we wouldn't have this opportunity uh, to be sitting here. Um, so can we introduce him with three very loud Haribos? His great Shams and Prabhu Ki. First of all, it's a very great honor to be here. Thank you so much. And especially to Sundar Nanda for letting us gather in his beautiful home. I've just taken two tours. <laughs> we got to the we got to the top and then came to the bottom and he said, No, no, I want to show you myself. So up again we went. I'm a little old for this. <laughs> but uh, and thanks to Ravi Talsania for arranging this wonderful meeting. Ravi is great. He came to visit me in Los Angeles a few months ago. We've become pretty good friends. I feel like I know all of you somehow. You know, you're like our spiritual children. To see you gathered here with your bright, shiny faces delights my heart. Thank you so much. I haven't been speaking much for about five years. I've been in kind of seclusion writing this book, so... I've taken a few notes. I hope you don't mind if I glance down from time to time with my glasses on. Where are my glasses? <laughs> <laughs> when, when Srila Prabhupada appeared among us back in 1966 67, <clears throat> all these young Westerners and the they call the 60s. He captured us with his personal beauty, first of all. We were outcasts, practically, outlaws, people who were addicted to a very sensual, sense grat life of sense gratification, and experimentation, meat, and drugs, every, any bad thing you can name. We were all part of that uh, lifestyle, but we saw Prabhupada, we saw somebody so beautiful, physically beautiful first. His face and his features and his grace and his, his whole body uh, captured us. That was the first thing, the attraction for this man. And then when he spoke, his words were, sure, they were the truth. They were, they were the real thing. So that got us even more. <coughs> But really, what captured us the most was Prabhupada's action. <clears throat> the action of Krishna consciousness, the activity of Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness begins, begins on a battlefield, in a war zone, which is the most active and riskiest activity of human endeavor. It's a battle zone, Krishna consciousness. So we were Prabhupada's troops. He was, he was our pirate chief. He was the head of the buccaneers. We were, we were drawn to, the, to our general by his courage and his bold behavior through the Prabhupada. We didn't have books. We didn't have one book. Can you imagine? We didn't have, know the philosophy at all, only what Prabhupada told us in his lectures. We had no routines in our lives. Prabhupada began to have morning classes and evening classes, so some routine began to enter our lives, but we didn't have all of the stuff you guys have now. There were no models. There was only Srila Prabhupada. This, this old man who had left his wife and his family and all the comforts of home, one out of how many people were living in India in those days? Almost a billion people. One man gave up everything, took that risk. He left his tradition. He left every comfort of home simply to bring this message of Krishna to us. Can you imagine? What a, what a great risk he took, how bold he was to do that. He said, I have come to save you. 
So as the general of our little army, he gave us our marching orders, which were very simple. He said, you become Krishna conscious and you spread Krishna consciousness. That's all. Nothing more. You don't know anything. Gradually you will learn. And this was what got us going. Spreading Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> I call my book Chasing Rhinos with the Swami because he said a, he, he made a very uh, uh, sometimes he used tiger but often, most often he used rhinoceros as the model for our the goal of our activities. He said, and I'll quote this exactly as I have it in the book, we should always be enthusiastic to try for capturing the rhinoceros. That way, if we fail, everyone will say, never mind, nobody can catch a rhinoceros anyway. And if we succeed, then everyone will say, just see what a wonderful thing they have done. So this was our motto. This was our creed. Go for the sky. Go for the limits. <clears throat> Where was I? Okay. You know, I can tell you stories about um, hunting, the, chasing the rhinos, all of the rhinos that we were bagging. and uh, as, as was just said, you've already heard that. You've heard most of the stories. And they're inspirational. But at the risk of thinking that's nostalgia for the, that's nostalgia of the past, how does this apply to me? I'll tell a few stories anyway, just a few brief stories, just to give you an idea. Set the scene, set the mood. You know, you, you can just imagine here's the, a group of young people in the West who had never even heard of Krishna. We had never even seen a book from India. There were no Indian people living there. We just had a faint idea that, that the answer to, the ancient answer to the solutions, of, to the solutions to life were probably from India. Somewhere they, they had this in their, their ancient culture. We must pay attention to what's coming from India. This was the mood. Now one day, Malati showed Prabhupada this little statue of this kind of weird figure with big eyes. And Prabhupada fell down on the ground and said, and he started worshiping it. I went, wow, what is this? He, he, he said, this is God. So can you imagine what we were thinking? <laughs> okay, if Prabhupada, if the Swami says he is, if this is God, then I accept that. And he said, now you must build a big cart, as big as this room, and put God, the God and his brother and sister on this cart and push him through the streets of San Francisco. Okay, okay. Well, that seems impossible, that type of thing. We had no money whatsoever. What to speak of overcoming the reluctance of the public and the, the people of San Francisco and America that we were doing something very wonderful. Well, we did it. Those were the kind of things that we just did. An impossible task, okay. This broke the ice. We began to start thinking big, like Srila Prabhupada wanted us. He said in 1968, go to London. I want a temple in London. More than almost any place in the world. I, need it. I want a temple in London to, to please my Guru Maharaj. So, okay. We had no money, nobody had a job. There were maybe 20, 30 of us in those days, and one or two had jobs. Jayananda drove a taxi in the daytime, but none of us had jobs. So where to get the money? Somehow or other, we got the money, and because Prabhupada said we should go to London, we went. <clears throat> in those days, the most, as was just, and you know the story over. The, the Beatles were the most famous men in the world. Nobody could meet the Beatles. It was an impossible task. They were more famous than presidents and prime ministers of the world. But within two and a half months of our arrival in England, we were having dinner with them, having kirtan. 
These were the kind of uh, rhinos we chased. Well, if we're going to meet somebody in England, let it be the Queen or the Beatles. We, we got the Beatles, we never did meet the Queen. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada uh, inspired us with this idea of extreme action to spread Krishna consciousness. Then he took us off to India. India, in those days, Krishna was practically unheard of anymore. It was a, almost extinct. The Krishna sect, the Krishna culture was almost gone from India. The Prabhupada took us to city after city after city. We put on these huge festivals and, and pandal programs that attracted millions of people. And within a year, a year's time, Within, uh, I've logged it in my book, described it, how in five weeks' time, Prabhupada laid the cornerstone on the three major temples we, we have today in India. In five weeks he did that. Mayapur, Vrindavan, and Juhu. In five weeks' time, Prabhupada masterminded laying the foundations of those three temples. It was impossible to get land anywhere of that size. In years it would take to get a piece of land in India, but Prabhupada push and push and push and took great extreme risks to get these kind of things done. And one of the key factors in all of this is that we were having fun doing it. It was a huge prank to pull <laughs> off these wild adventures for Prabhupada. We had so much fun looking back on those days. We were laughing constantly. And if you look at pictures taken, photographs from those days, uh, with devotees in the back, and most of the time they're, they're laughing or smiling. Everybody's cracking up at something Prabhupada just said. It was an endeavor of, it was like almost like a family endeavor. Everyone knew each other so well, we joked and played doing these incredible feats. He asked me to be, be his secretary in June of 1971. And the first thing we did was go to Russia. In those days, you can't imagine now, maybe some of the older men here or women can remember, but it was called the Iron Curtain. It went across, divided east and west. And this side was communism, this side was capitalism. And they were both ready to drop the bomb on each other at any moment. There was extreme tension in the world even more than this terrorism thing that's going on these days. We were trained as children in school, in elementary school, to hide under the desks when the atomic bomb was going to go off. We had atomic bomb drills once a week in our schools. That's how tense the world was. No Americans could go to Russia. It was impossible. Unless you got kidnapped and taken there or something. But somehow or other, we got in there. And in five days, Prabhupada was able to change the world. He changed the world in five days. Because of Prabhupada's presence, I still feel that communism fell. He, the, the second day we were there was a Sunday, and they had a, every Sunday they had a military parade through Red Square and passed the, down the street where our hotel was. And Prabhupada watched out the window on that Sunday afternoon, all the rockets going by on these long lorries, you know, like 100 foot long rockets, and big guns, and ghost-stepping soldiers, hour after hour going by the hotel. And he turned around to me in the room, and there was a tear in his eye, and he said, this government cannot last. You cannot rule a country by fear. He said, within 20 years, this will all fall down. Almost exactly 20 years later, <laughs> It fell. But Prabhupada was so busy organizing all of these incredible things. When I joined with Prabhupada, we were the second temple in the world. By the time we left Russia, there were 90 temples in a two or three year span. Uh, it was a vast undertaking. And Prabhupada managed everything. He managed every aspect of it from, through his letters. There was no email. There were no fast communications. It was all done by letter. So being his secretary was an important post. I could, I, 
everything he said I wrote down or recorded and, and I put the the answers to every devotee who sent him a letter got a reply. And whatever their their, their concerns were, Prabhupada answered in every letter. And in this way he managed this vast expansion, this huge rhino hunt. So 80, 90 temples. Now Bhagavad told me today that we have 600 temples out in the world, 600 Krishna temples. So in some sense, this, this risk, this sense of adventure and risk, that phase is over, that first phase, it's finished. There are no more countries to conquer. So perhaps you're asking, well, what's, what's next? My life in Krishna consciousness is kind of cozy. It's routine now. It's almost predictable. Mm. Maybe the most I'm risking now every day is or once a week is going out on Sankirtan. <laughs> so you've learned all the principles now gotten the philosophy, you've absorbed the lifestyle, you know all of the routines, you know how Krishna consciousness works, you know more than anyone else in the world, you know the greatest secret of secrets, you've absorbed the Vedic philosophy that Prabhupada gave us completely, you know more than anyone, but are you spreading Krishna consciousness? Now, that phase is over when you can take great risks and go out in the world and, and open new temples. That used to be the way it was done. And so life has become a bit dull here in England, I suppose, as <laughs> I, I've noticed. <clears throat> and the adventures and risks you can take to spread Krishna consciousness are now limited in some ways, from one point of view. <clears throat> I've noticed since I came to London a few days ago that all these people are walking down the street with their devices in their hands. They're not even looking at each other anymore. They're sitting in offices texting to each other. And they stop talking. There's something new I'm seeing. The, the machine age, the robotic age is here. Radhanath and I spent a half an hour today trying to turn on our television set. <laughs> Couldn't do it. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's time for you as devotees to start waking people up. It's time again. It's, it's almost like the 1950s, the age of conformity, when everything became black and white. It's time to blow the world up into technicolor again. There's a, a time, it's a wonderful time for you, an opportunity for you to head out into a new direction of risk and adventure for Krishna. It's not that you have to go out and start new temples anymore, those days are gone. But now, how, what advantages you have before you to spread Krishna consciousness? The phone in everybody's pocket is connected with every other person in the world right now. Not? And all of you are kind of masters of how to use it. I can't even make a phone call. I don't know how, but you guys know how to do this stuff. So it's time to put Hare Krishna all over the landscape again. <clears throat> Ravi was saying this morning on our train ride up here this afternoon, he said, you know, I wish I, wish I could take risks like you guys did and go out and do stuff like you did. And I thought, well, maybe it's because, at first I thought, well, maybe our generation in, in, in America, it was just genetic because our, or maybe because our, it was traditional that our parents were pioneers opening up a new country. Maybe that's the state of mind that we were raised. So that was easy for us to go out and do things like that. But then I began thinking that, no, wait a minute. Taking risks and doing things, adventurous things uh, in life. Any obstacle to that is just an illusion. There's no real obstacles to anyone's potential. There are, it's just a state of mind. It's a state of mind. 
purely a state of mind that I'm limited in any way. Everything is unlimited, especially with Krishna behind you. You know, this battle is raging on, the war is still going on all around us. And Krishna consciousness takes place on a battlefield. This risk and adventure are the, the heart and soul of Srila Prabhupada's movement. Why has this spirit dwindled? Well, <clears throat> the challenge is still there. We're not spreading Krishna consciousness like we could. In those days, we got to England, and within four or five months of us being here, the whole world heard the Hare Krishna mantra. Okay, that happened. That was a wonderful rhino, but, and it was in, but it was in the past. It can't happen again. Come on. It can happen infinite times. It can happen now in a bigger way than ever before. Ever before. I know all you have to do is make the right connection on your device and a million people will hear about Krishna. And your parents and your grandparents, most of you, they gave up everything to come to this country. They were pioneers. Your parents and your grandparents were great pioneers of India for the most part. They gave up everything in the homeland to come here and make this wonderful opportunity for you. They've given you everything. The spirit of pioneerism is in your blood too. Your parents are, were like Vikings. They came first. The good doctor here has set up this wonderful, he's been so successful. But now it's in your hands. You have to chase the rhino now. It's a new rhino, but it's, it's the same rhino. <clears throat> you have all of these advantages. You've had, the, you know, you've had such good education. You've had the, the opportunity to absorb the greatest philosophy in the world. You have business experience, good business experience. All of you are good businessmen. So do something big. Put billboards on every motorway in England that say, Hare Krishna, bring it back. You're, you're all these motivational speakers, I'm sure many of you boys hear these motivational speakers in your corporations and your businesses tell you to think outside the box. That's become almost a droll phrase. We don't really understand what that means anymore, but we give it lip service. Oh, let's think outside the box. Think outside Prabhupada's box, the big box. Prabhupada, you know, even before he came to America, was trying to get some books in the hands of the president of India. He was writing to president, this president and that president, please help me come to America. Nobody helped him. But he was never gave up that idea of thinking big, thinking big. <clears throat> and here's the reward for that get to see and touch Krishna, the bigger you try. Krishna has promised. He said, I will personally interfere to remove obstacles to your service. So if you want the, if you want Krishna firsthand and the biggest exposure to Krishna, you have to try for something big. Catch that spirit of Srila Prabhupada. Dare and risk for Krishna. And he has to come and stand by your side and push. He has to drive your chariot. He's promised. And I've personally experienced this. I can tell you, it works. I mean, any of the older devotees who went out on these massive escapades got to see Krishna up close. And that way you win his heart. You're young. Your adventure should be now. Don't wait until you're old and broken to strive out to do something, to take a big step for Krishna. Try to fly to the moon now. Spread his name and fame 
And this is, this is Srila Prabhupada's challenge to us and his assignment for us. And especially now. Now is all that exists. There was no past. We didn't do any of all that stuff in the past. It's not even worthwhile talking about it. You can read it in my book if you want. <laughs> <laughs> you can give me some money for my book and I'll, I'll spend it. <laughs> but I want to spend it, I'm going only to spend it to travel from temple to temple now. I've cut all the ties. I'd sold my house in Los Angeles, all my gave away all my furniture, even my television set, which I became very attached to. <laughs> I can almost tell you word for word every commercial it was on. <laughs> but uh, clothes, bags of clothes, I gave away Salvation Army. Because now I see it. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to travel around and meet all you people and travel to the exotic temples, 600 temples, Bhagavad tells me. I want to see Siberia, Brazil. <laughs> All these wonderful places. Murmansk, I've heard, has a temple. And the northernmost city, big city in the world. <laughs> we have a temple there. And all the potential and the young people in all these places just needs to be <clears throat> harnessed somehow. <clears throat> so there are no more frontiers. You are dead wrong. Srila Prabhupada and myself and the early pioneer devotees who sacrificed everything to give you guys this golden chance. And you have the means now and the numbers. There's so many of you. And the energy, your young energy, and the education and your intelligence. Every tool to launch Krishna consciousness rocket to Mars. If you only desire to do it, you can change the world, now and forevermore. This is Srila Prabhupada's challenge to you. And we're passing the flame to you. Now you take it and run. And you know, now that's enough talk from me. I, I would like to hear <coughs> one devotee, Yasoda, or which one is Yasoda? There's he told me that you guys have some plans, you're hatching some schemes to spread Krishna consciousness. I want to hear what, what, you, what you've got in mind. What kind of things do you plan to do? Uh, nothing at all is uh, anything that we find is ready to do. But um, uh, one thing we've always wanted in the UK uh, was, was a chain of restaurants where people could come and touch it to the Restaurants, a chain of restaurants, that's a good idea. Yeah, this Govinda's is a famous restaurant, we have just one. And there are other Govindas around the world that seem to attract a lot of people to Krishna consciousness. That's one idea, good one. <clears throat> I was just thinking that this is the advent of your book distribution marathon just now. I told a story this morning's class that that um, my dear god brother ba uh, Bhavananda just told me in Mumbai a few days back. He said that he was sitting with Prabhupada once and he said, asked Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, did you come from the spiritual world? And Prabhupada said, yes. I did not want to come. It's a horrible place. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I resisted, and Krishna again asked me, I said, no, no, I don't want to go to that place. And then Krishna said, but you have to write your books, and then I understood. So Prabhupada came here to give us these books. Without those books, how can anything happen? So I was thinking, you know, what we have to think outside the box sometimes how to distribute Prabhupada's books. I mean, you're all so brilliant. 
You can go out on the street and work hard all day in Sankirtan and sell a few books. Or you can think, hmm, how can I sell 10,000 books at a stroke? That can be done. You just have to think how to do it. And organize yourself to do it and have the courage. Supposing you, you uh, convince some very wealthy man, well, you buy 1,000 books for your employees or something like that. So Bhagavad Gita. Some hotel chain owner, and then I know there are many Indian hotel chain owners, because in America you can't go to a motel not owned by a Patel. <laughs> <laughs> so you convince that man. You buy 10,000 books and put one in every hotel, in every room in every hotel, something like that. There are ways to think how to do what Prabhupada wants. And you guys have them all within your grasp. You know, when, I, I love this place so much, so I live in England. I'm going back to India next week on Wednesday, but and w my book is being printed this winter. When I have books in hand, I'll, I want to come back. Yeah. I, we can mm -hmm. spend some time and work out some programs to really fire up this country. It can be done very quickly with God. Look at all of you. There were like six or eight of us, period. That's all there was. And we were able to do it. Why can't you do it? All right. Anyway, that's the gist of what I want to talk about. I'd like to hear some input and see what, what you guys think of all this and what your plans are. Any questions or comments anyone has? Yes. I have a question about Russia. Yeah. Like when you went to Russia. Yeah. How did you get the Bhagavad Gita inside with the security and all that? Well, they told us at the embassy, you, you cannot take any literature of any kind, except some Soviet literature. <laughs> But Malati s sneaked that Bhagavad Gita into my suitcase when I wasn't looking. She put it right on top. <laughs> so when the KGB guy opened the luggage, that thing was right on top of the book. Ah, huh? what is this? And she had yeah. put a whole bunch of photos of Prabhupada and Krishna and so on in there. But when he opened the book, it, they went all over the place. Uh. <laughs> And he was so embarrassed, and all the other guys around him were picking, running around picking up the photos. He was so embarrassed by our presence that he said, go, go, go. <laughs> and that one Bhagavad Gita is responsible for thousands of people learning about Krishna. That boy took it, Ananta Shakti, a Russian boy. His name was Anatol then. And he mimeographed it. They typed it, translated it, typed it in English and in Russian, and they ran it on these underground mimeograph machines. You had to crank them manually, page by page, and with carbon, with carbons, three or four carbon copies at a time. That's all very slow. But with those Bhagavad Gitas, they, they started traveling around underground all over Russia. When I went back to Russia about four years ago, I think it was, the 50th, 50th anniversary, 40th maybe, 1971 to 2011 is 40, right? 50. <laughs> Just see. <laughs> Somebody as stupid as I am can do it. You guys can do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> And they told me that because of that Bhagavad Gita and the, and the underground uh, uh, attention of, of Krishna, about the Hare Krishnas, that a whole branch of KGB was founded just to deal with the Hare Krishna problem. Yeah. And there was a, a former KGB agent who had become a devotee. He gave a speech. And he said, when I went out to persecute the Krishnas, they convinced me that Krishna was good. And he became a devotee. Yeah. But so many people suffered uh, in the name of Krishna. Yes? Um, that, that last point you made is something we could all really take a lesson from. In the, in well, the late 80s, we were running uh, campaigns for free devotees who were in prison. That's right. And then, of course, that put the salt and bread campaign. And uh, 
things I want to say here about this is that, you know, we, I, I remember in those days, I was TP and all so on, we, we were sitting in central London, free to do whatever we liked, and, you know, three hours plane ride away, just by being a devotee, your life was in danger, mm -hmm. or you could be tortured, and that this devotee, you know, the he, mm -hmm. he was tortured with psychotropic drugs yeah. to the point where he couldn't he couldn't stand still for at one point in his yeah. life. He was so full of these things that yeah. devotees would have their fingernails pulled off mm. one by one and trying to by these KGB men trying to get them to tell them where their bookstore was. Yeah, or who the other devotees or are. who the other devotees were so breath. The devotees said at this time quite a number of devotees went home. Mm. And I was thinking, well yeah that that'd be me. Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you everything. Just <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to join these guys anyway. <laughs> but, but, but yeah. So the last thing, like you said about the KGB, had a had a branch just to deal with the Hare Krishna. Yeah, you know, but I think the point I, the point I'm trying to make tonight yeah. is that you don't have to be faced with those kind of extreme situations of sacrifice to force you your you to take risk. It's not that here in England we have, we're, like you said, we're totally free to do anything we want. We have to develop some kind of very creative ways now to spread Krishna consciousness. Uh, we, we don't have to do it underground like they did. Everywhere in the world is different, but here you have such a wonderful launching place. All the tools you need to spread Krishna. You have all of these Wonderful. How many people work in the IT business here? What? <laughs> Only one? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All of you know how to work this phone, right? This iPhone. Even that is, to me, an impossible task. <laughs> and computers, my goodness. How many work in compute with computers every day? Everyone. Everyone. Figure out a way to link yourself to the world. Let the world know about Krishna. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so we, um, one thing that you had when you came to London was the conviction, faith, and profile. Yeah. And I think you really doubled your gem that you were clutching onto because that was the main thing which kept you going and had the, the, you know, the enthusiasm to carry on. I think we need you to inspire all of us as to what that conviction faith was and how can we be as strong as we aim to be as strong as you were. So that would launch this, yeah. what you just mentioned. Well, this conviction comes. It's not just you have it from meeting Prabhupada one time or any, anything like that, it, it grows, the conviction and faith in Krishna grow as you risk. First you have to risk. I mean, if, if you believe enough what Prabhupada is telling you, that you take a, a little step forward and a bigger step, you'll see that the conviction starts coming in space because Krishna becomes personally present in your life. The conviction grows. It doesn't have to be there first before you do something, even a little seed of conviction, if you take a big step out of that box, wow, Krishna replies personally to your efforts. You get to, oh, there he is. I begin to see him acting more and more in my life, the more risk I take. So by the time we came to London, we were convinced because we'd already done so many things that convinced us. Krishna convinced us. Prabhupada didn't have to, in, in a way. He gave us the walking steps, the marching orders. Try this, and you'll see. So that you have to... Each, each person is different, and Krishna has a different personal relationship with you. But whatever abilities you have, whatever instincts you have to do something as a service to Krishna, Try it out, but a little bit bigger scale than you thought possible. That you think may fail, 
You're going for the rhino. It may fail, but no one will say, ah, oh, he failed. They will say, oh, he tried, but that's an impossible thing anyway. No. He's done very well. You're, you always succeed with Krishna. You never fail. Your bank balance stays the same or bigger constantly. It accrues. Nine years ago, you told me that person. You told me that story about um, the printing of Krishna book. Um, and Prabhupada asked you to ask George, um, and that was one of the turning points for me in Krishna consciousness. Would you like to share that story with all of us, Prabhu? Uh, okay. Prabhupada said, and you were not convinced that you would do that, and then what happened with the lightning? So just please share that story. It was a beautiful story. Oh, yeah. You already gave away the punch. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Prabhupada, you know, he, he would just point. He, he would say, go and do that. And so it, he left it up to you to decide how to do it. He never, well, he directed in some ways if you asked him a question. But you didn't want to take, consume Prabhupada's time by help, asking him to help you plan anything. So he told me one day, well, I want George to print the, George Harrison to print pay for the Krishna book printing. I said, Prabhupada, our whole relationship with George is there because we've never asked him for anything. You can't ask these famous people who are approached every day, a hundred times a day, to, be, to give something. To, so everyone's begging from them something. Our relationship was special because we never asked George for anything. So how can I ask him, Prabhupada? And he laughed and said, you, because your your spiritual master has asked you, <laughs> you make me the bad guy. He says, you say to George, my spiritual master has asked me to ask you. Then he will not blame you. <laughs> <laughs> so we were together that evening at a dinner in a man's house in Wimbledon. And... It was a stormy day. We had spent the afternoon looking at marble for the Berry Place Temple, for the new, new altar we were building. And George had very graciously contributed 3,000 or 5,000 pounds for this marble, a large amount of money. Along with the, we were with the most famous sculptor in, Indi in England at the time, David Wynn. So he helped us select the marble. It's very special marble. So I thought that was plenty, you know. Oh, now tonight I've got to ask him for this Krishna book. $19,000, which is a lot of money in those days, probably equivalent to maybe 100000 or more dollars now. So I waited, we had dinner, and it was, it was a stormy day, raining. But we had dinner late, it got later and later, and they served dessert. We finished our dessert. I knew that within a few moments everyone would leave the house and I had to drive back to London. So I screwed up my courage and said, George, I have to ask you something that my spiritual master asked me. <laughs> <laughs> would you kindly publish this book, Krishna? And his face got, oh, immediately anger came in. Face. And I could see the thought in his head, oh, these, are, these Krishnas are just like everybody else. And suddenly a bolt of lightning hit the house. Blam! It shook us in our seats. It hit the house. The lights went out. The whole house shook and the lights went out. And we were just dead silence around the table in the dark. You couldn't see anything for maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And then the lights flashed back on. The music started back up. And I looked at George and he had this huge grin on his face. <laughs> he said, well, how much is it then? <laughs> That's a, Krishna's direct interference. There's no more graphic example than that. And this way you get to see Krishna in action. And the goal of our lives, really, is, as Bhagavad was pointing out tonight, Everything is Krishna anyway. Everything is Krishna. Once we begin, can begin to see that externally, everything is Krishna. It's in every atom, every molecule. And the 
working in the phenomenal world around us. And he's also inside us, inside every atom in our body. And he's there as Paramatma to guide us and help us. So how can he not interfere in your life? He's everything anyway. So if you think big and try something big to please him, just think how easily it is for him. We don't want to ask anything of Krishna. We never want to ask, bother Krishna. He's, he's feeding every ant in the creation. What, what does he have time for me? Come on. But if he sees his devotee making a special effort to serve him, somehow or other, he comes into your life personally becomes your friend or your father or however you want to relate with him he's there it's a wonderful thing and you get it faster and bigger by risking yourself risking your reputation risking your money risking your energy risking your family but risking your relationships you can risk anything. Like that. I mean, they don't mean anything anyway. You're here in this body right now, you have a father and mother, but none of them are really you. Uh, <clears throat> oh, this is uh, I just wanted to um, play devil's advocate. Um, I wanted to ask, what's wrong with someone who says they do a little service for the temple, um, who says they look after their family, they do their chanting, they do their sadhana, or a student that says, oh, I go to university on Sundays, I go to the temple, um, and I don't see the need to step out of that routine. I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. So what, what's wrong with that? That's all right. That's all right. If you want to be comfortable, it's all right. Krishna gives you whatever you want, but you won't get Krishna like that in the in the in the quantity that you deserve. You know, we all deserve to be back in the spiritual sky. We're just here, almost like a punishment, uh, and to become comfortable with this situation, the material <laughs> world, it's a way, a form of uh, giving up. It's a form of. Uh, underestimating ourselves. Yeah. We've underestimated, when we become comfortable with this material world, we've underestimated our own potential. We've sold ourselves out. Yeah. And you might you know, make a little progress in spiritual life, but it's only a few dollars in your spiritual bank account. You have to come back then. It's time to get out of this place. It's a horrible place. It's a place of pain and suffering, and to think that it's not, that I'm comfortable with my routines, that I'll get a little pleasure from serving at the temple once a week or whatever, is not the goal of Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada didn't come here to give us this knowledge for us to be sedate and comfortable with it. He came here to wake us up, take us out of here, and, and to, you know, whatever spiritual master you have has to keep coming back eternally until you're delivered. This is, Prabhupada told us this, that you must make every effort because I don't want to come back here. <laughs> I have to stay with you until you're delivered eternally. That's my job. It's my responsibility. So you become responsible to me and do everything you can to leave, get out of this place. Become Krishna conscious. One, maybe two, spread Krishna. Those are the only two things. We, by our preaching and our spreading Krishna conscious, we become Krishna conscious. They go hand in hand. They're not separate activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That answer. Yeah. 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 Just another another question on that. Um, we hear a lot of Prabhupada saying. Um, Prabhupada always says distribute his books, mm -hmm. and give his books out. Um, could you could you also argue that when he's saying distribute his books, he's he's not actually talking about physical books because in this day and age, not many people read physical mm -hmm. books. 
yeah. they watch videos online, they watch and they have that iPhone application right. and they, they learn from that kind of media. So could you also say that he's also saying more emphasis in spreading Christian conscious knowledge? Yes, the rather, knowledge. Rather than just physical books. Well, I guess that if you want to you know, split hairs, that's, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, we're moving into an age when there are no physical books anymore, but the knowledge is, is what he's referring to in that sense. I'm sure Prabhupada would be very pleased with the way, you know, the devotees have taken to this digital age. My goodness, when I wrote this, I mean, I could never have written this book until now. I had to wait. 73 years to write this book because I had the Veda base in my computer. I could look up everything Prabhupada did and said on that one day, day after day, year after year, it's all logged into that one wonderful Veda base. I could research and find out what the weather was in London on May 23rd, 1972. You know? Oh, it rained in the morning and the afternoon it was, there was, oh yes, I now remember Prabhupada had his umbrella, he was walking in Regents Park because it was raining that morning, like that. So that's a wonderful tool, all of this stuff that's come out now. And to spread Krishna consciousness through that tool is the same as distributing books, so distributing knowledge. That's, that's, you're right on that. It's a new definition. Yeah. Yes? Um, a lot of people say these days, well, that those days are gone, now we should focus on boiling the milk or you know, putting a lot into our devotee relationships or cultivating, you know, all the people who we've brought in or, you know, obviously the preaching is still going on, but those people who come in, maybe they don't have the same spirit as, you know, in the hippie days where everyone was looking for something so desperately. So now, you know, people are kind of coming in by osmosis or they're, or they're just, you know, kind of mildly interested. And then, so how do we balance the concept of boiling the milk or, or giving ourselves to cultivating our relationships and our, our, our depth in Krishna consciousness and still, you know, wanting to do these big things or connect with, you know, in a large way or, you know, yeah. chasing the rhino. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very good question. Um, you know, I, I'm not, you know, a young man anymore, so I, I don't quite, you know, I, I understand what's happened in the, recent history about how now we've gone through a cycle of that huge expansion and those frontiers are no longer there. Uh, I, I refer to it in my talk as uh, new countries to conquer. We don't have that anymore. Now we're, we're kind of catching up with what we should have done maybe more in the past is, we, is knit ourselves into a tighter community and bring in those who have like minds and get them interested in, in all of that. I don't see any conflict that that can't go on while big projects are also going on. There's no, you know, the variety is the spice of life. And, and if anyone has bigger ideas, they should, I think the time is right now for expansion in a huge way. We Now we've settled this social problem, I think. I think it's there now. The temples are there, the communities are there in a wonderful way maybe becoming a little complacent. Maybe it's time to shake up the, the circuits a little bit. Okay. You know, do some <laughs> big stuff. And it's easy now with all the tools you guys have, and the education and the uh, intelligence. Krishna consciousness has grown in a kind of underground way in the last couple of decades. I mean, there are devotees all over the world that you run into to weird places I never would expect to see a devotee. I see somebody like that. They're just kind of like silently moving out there. But maybe it's time to get them all gathered and start working on some things together. In bigger ways. That's all I'm trying to promote. I feel the time is right for that again. And like I was saying a little earlier, it's like the 50s again. It's becoming a, an age of conformity. All over the globe, there's, there's complacency that we need to kind of get out of that you know, mood and, and start spreading Krishna in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I'm going to think on that some more. Very really good. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I just want to ask, like, 
you can book marathon starting tomorrow. Yes. Um, what was it that you were saying when you were going out on the street, when you were talking, trying to get in contact with people? How were you approaching it? What, what kind of things did you say to give us inspiration for when we're out? Good question. Well, in the first place, we didn't have any books. We spent our early years uh, trying to get the books printed and distribute them in a way that <clears throat> it was the beginning of something. We didn't quite understand what it was, book distribution. Um, for the most part, I was so busy actively raising money for the books and get, trying to get them distributed out to temples and things like that that I never had time to even read the books. I was talking with one by this, have a look, like that. It's the same God that you call Jehovah or Allah or whatever they call it. This, this is uh, something that uh, I think you'll find very interesting because it's so encyclopedic. We, Our books, your Bible may be this thick, but compared to our, not our books, I mean, we have a stack of books to the ceiling, all knowledge of God, every aspect of God. Our philosophy is complete. You don't brag like that, but you might find it interesting, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess in in this day and age, sometimes we try and package Krishna consciousness in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it, it can be seen as perhaps sugarcoating it or maybe even diluting it somewhat <coughs> to to account or to cater <coughs> for for the audience. Mm. What do you think is the balance between giving the pure mm. this is what Prabhupada says, or sometimes we see in the old videos of book distribution saying this is the book of my spiritual master mm. and just giving giving it. Um, how did you approach, for example, when you when you met the celebrities or everyone? Did did you try and <coughs> cater to how they may see it, or did you just give what Prabhupada has given us? Mm -hmm. how, what's the balance? Here? Well, you know, Prabhupada's response to everything was according to time, place, and circumstance. I mean, there might be an occasion to really lay it on somebody if the time is right. There might be an occasion to sugarcoat it. Prabhupada did all that. If the person he was uh, talking with needed chiding, like I saw him in India say, you people are from India, shame on you. You're not following what your ancestors gave you. And these Westerners over here, they're, they're having to bring it back to you. And he would chide. And his audience like that. Other times he was so sweet and charming to the to a person. So it dep depends on time, place, and circumstance. All methods of preaching are open game. You have to play it by ear yourself as you, there's no fixed way. Celebrities, yes, you have to sugarcoat to some extent. It depends on their readiness. You know? Some celebrities will never be. Prabhupada always said, too, that well, some people will never change. You cannot change a person. Don't waste your time on certain people. So that has to be kept in mind as well when you're preaching. This person will never change. So you go on to the next one. Um, you know, it, each, each encounter is individual. But each, and each person has a way of delivering, too, their preaching that's unique. So it may work on one person better than another as, they, as they're preaching, you know. Somebody who sugarcoats Krishna, that's an effective way of preaching. So you, but you have to select the people that that's best for. And other people respond better to a, a harsh argument. A logician would... Prabhupada would meet with logicians and just pound them <laughs> with every argument. He would quote Latin, and English poets. Yeah. Uh, when, 
I, I graduated in philosophy in college. That's what I studied. I majored in philosophy. And Prabhupada found out, found that out one day, and he said, <clears throat> "Ah, you are a philosopher. Huh? Okay, you come to my room every morning, and you be the Western philosopher, and I will debate you." So every morning I had to, I read my notes and I'd study you know, the synopsis of Western philosophy and I would learn uh, in a short form the different philosophy, philosophies. And we started with uh, Aristotle and Plato and worked our way right up to Heidegger and the modern philosophers, the existentialists, with about maybe a hundred philosophers, something like that, a large amount, fifty philosophers. So each morning I'd prepare and I'd get in the mood, I'm going to defeat Prabhupada. He cannot deny this. I'd go in and I would take the roll. Yeah, back and forth, he would bat the ball. And every time he defeated me. By the end of the hour or two, that we would discuss Darwin or Kant or whatever. I would feel defeated, but I would feel enlightened. Prabhupada defeated me and he was right. So you can, some people, you can argue that strongly with. You know, yeah, whatever your skill level in argument, use that. Or you sweet talk somebody, that's fine too. Bring them to Krishna, whatever it takes. <laughs> Prabhupada's books will convince them, or not. That's the final thing, the book. So if you get a book in their hands, it's a great, wonderful service. Just convinced them to read a little. And I was sit talking earlier, mentioning maybe you can figure out ways to sell larger amount of books in clever ways, or, or downloads, or whatever they are nowadays. <laughs> you know, you're very clever boys. You can figure this out in a huge way. We have uh, one last question. Yes. Did you, you had a question? Did you have a question? Or a point? A, a little comment that I had on the disturbance. So just one point that um, you made right from the beginning was that you heard from Shinto and he, he imbibed a sense of urgency mm. and, and a sense of excitement. I don't know about you, but a lot of young devotees, they say to me, well, you saw Srila Prabhupada, you heard Srila Prabhupada, and, uh, you know, how, how can we have a relationship with Srila Prabhupada? Mm. But we, we need to bear in mind, like, devotees like yourself, you have a lot of intimate association mm. with Srila Prabhupada, but most of his disciples didn't. That we would see Srila Prabhupada come and greet the deities, uh, we'd sit while he gave Bhagavatam class, or sometimes in the evening uh, Gita classes, or sometimes we'd get a chance to go on a morning walk, mm. uh, or be in a room conversation. But we didn't, very few of Srila Prabhupada's disciples actually spoke directly with him, no. or got some direct instruction no. from him. But the, the, the point that I make with people is that even, like you said, well, that's all in the past in our lives, too. It's 38 years since any of us saw Srila Prabhupada. And our connection with him, though, could be very vital and real right now because there's six to 9,000 hours of Srila Prabhupada speaking with this same sense of urgency that he spoke to you in San Francisco and Montreal and London. Yeah. And, and, and my experience is, you sit regularly and listen to Srila Prabhupada speak, mm. and you know you have a relationship with mm. him, and yes. uh, you know he's speaking to you, mm. and that, that can give you so much strength and courage to, to take the kind of risk that you're talking yeah. about, yeah. because you know he's with you. Well, 
Here's an important point to remember also that Prabhupada probably spent less than one hour with his own spiritual master. He spent very little time with Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And look what that little touch produced. So it's not the amount of time you spend with your spiritual master. He's there with you all the time. It, it, it doesn't work that way. It's a transcendental relationship you have with him. It's eternal and it's individual. And it's not just Srila Prabhupada, but most of you probably have your own guru. I mean, Radhanath or Shiva Ram, somebody like that is your guru. Your guru is your guru. And he's in the same chain as Prabhupada. Through your own guru, you get Prabhupada. It isn't that you have you skip over and, and try to make a relationship with Srila Prabhupada. You have to have a spiritual master. You have to have a spiritual master. Without that spiritual initiation by a spiritual master, you're in the you're you're stumbling in the dark. You have to have that personal connection with a guru. And through him, all the other gurus, right up to Krishna himself, act in a direct line. So, and what I think what I was trying to bring out tonight is, you want to please that spiritual master. Not only please him, that's usually pretty easy to do. Your spiritual master is pleased if you just chant some round. But you want to catch his attention. You want to get your spiritual, your guru's attention. Yeah. And the only way to get that attention is to strive for it. Do everything you can to get your guru's attention. This is the key to life. Look at Prabhupada. He only had a, a few hours with his spiritual master. But he's, he got his attention when he started doing this stuff, when he came to America. I mean, you could just see them together somewhere now. He reached out over all the decades that it took Prabhupada to get ready and come here. And his spiritual master was 30 years in the grave before he came to America. So it isn't like you have to spend time with someone to get their, uh, the blessing that they give you. It's... It's, you have to get their attention. That's all. They're eternal, these people. These gurus. They, they have to stay here and help us. As long as we're, we struggle here. So we have to please them and get out of here.